All right, we're going to go to uh, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, this has been uh, long in waiting, uh, but uh, I hope that this information will be something that will be new and also, more importantly, where you can be able to be aware of the times and then know how, as a Bible-believing Christian, live under these times. So we've heard about the buyout that Elon Musk did uh, at uh, Twitter, and then we saw the whole liberal world throw themselves in a frenzy, and they thought that it's the end of the world. This is the end of the world that they know it. The reason why is because they no longer have control. That's the reason why they're freaking out. All right. The point is, as long as it's them controlling it, if Biden was in charge of Twitter, they throw their hands in joy. So that's the problem with these people. It's not about free speech absolutism. They always like to throw in terms, right? You know, free speech absolutism. <laughs> My foot, so I can make up words too. So they always throw in terms. They always throw in terms because terms are very powerful where people use that so that they can sound smart, okay? Or they got an argument, but that's nothing, you know, that's pretty much nothing to me. Anyways, because of this, the whole liberal world is freaking out, and it's just so hilarious, you know. I just sit back, and I just uh, laugh my head off. So we heard about also about the, the Supreme Court case where we got that leaked draft, Roe versus Wade. So it seems like that there is some kind of a comeback that's arising. And then, uh, Lord willing, who knows, maybe I'll talk about that in the next Bible study on Wednesday about what's going on at the Supreme Court. But right now I want to talk about Elon Musk. Uh, what's the Christian reaction to this, the Christian response? To be quite honest, uh, it's mostly like um, we, do have a, uh, we do have that joy, so to speak, where the liberal world, because they want to control free speech, of course we might be, uh, we might be joyous that there might be some level of freedom of speech. However, we don't care too much about it either the reason why is because uh, Elon Musk, he is not a Bible believer, for some people who might be shocked. I'll cover about his testimony where he was proclaimed to be a Christian by the Babylon Bee. I'll cover that one. But then uh, they, he's not a Bible-believing Christian, one. And number two, there is something that we should be wary about him. There was one time where he gave a prediction about Bitcoin, but then we see how much it didn't really go well. And then in this case scenario, we don't know. So what we do is just, Musk is just like many other significant people. The death of Michael Jackson. What should Christians do about it? Nothing. People die, people go, people do their things. The devil's going to build up his one world order system. All Christians need to do is focus on their church activities and winning souls to Jesus Christ because it's all about the souls. All right? The wor whole world can go to hell. Why? Because it will go to hell. The Antichrist has to take it over. And then we have to wait for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the end to come and make things right. Now, covering some interesting things, we can see here that we are... I'm going to show you that what Elon Musk is doing could usher in, like, probably the next step would be the tribulation coming in. That's how close we are. And that's the reason why he's a very significant figure, I believe. Now, before we cover uh, these parts... Uh, for some of you who are not aware about the stories, just a little background. In the article that you can read, and all of these are main street, uh, mainstream news sources or academic journals. So this is not where some people might think this is some wild conspiracy blog. No, if I do that, then I'll obviously give a disclaimer on that. But uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal, the title of their article, The Shadow Crew Who Encouraged Elon Musk Twitter Takeover. But for some of you who don't know, Jack Dorsey was the one in charge. But then obviously, we can see where he was distancing himself. Now, according to the Wall Street Journal, this is what happened with Jack Dorsey. A lot of us have been upset with his liberal uh, policies and control but it became so out of hand and so extremely liberal that even Dorsey himself was getting sick and tired of it, supposedly. That's how bad it was. I mean, if you get like Bill Mayer and some of these guys and Elon Musk, who was 50 uh, liberal, 50% conservative, if you, got hype, if you got these liberals pushing their ideology, trust me, the, the other liberals, they'll get sick and tired of it. 
They'll get sick and tired of it. But anyway, according to this article, it says, after his exit, Mr. Dorsey turned openly critical of the company and its board of directors. So he was getting sick and tired of it himself. He also said this, why is it that he was able to turn it over to Elon Musk? He said, quote, Elon is the singular solution I trust. Mr. Dorsey tweeted on April 25th, the day Twitter accepted Mr. Musk's bid. I trust his mission to extend the light of consciousness. Hmm. So we can see right here that Twitter is going to a, a new turning point, And obviously the liberals just, they just threw a fit. It's just so hilarious. It was so bad that the Twitter... The liberal Twitter board, they were just panicking, going into frenzy, that they were doing some shady things and they were doing some backhanded things, some strange things themselves. They called it a hostile takeover. So they mentioned right here that the board did a poison pill strategy, they called it, where on April 15th, they introduced this poison pill strategy that would allow shareholders to buy additional stock should a hostile takeover occur as a means. Why? To block. To block must take over as well. But you know Musk, this guy has so much money that he just amped it up to $44 billion and then probably up to $46.5 billion, etc. So however the amount is. But he just amped it up so much that there was no way that these liberals could take it over. Now why did uh, Musk do that? Some reports claim it's because of what happened to the Babylon Bee. So according to this article by Bloomberg, it's uh, titled, Elon Musk opined about buying Twitter after Babylon Bee ban. So when Babylon Bee, you know, they do their sarcasms, and apparently they just reference the wrong pronoun of a thing. That's all I'll say, Okay. I never said it was a human, all right? It's not something where you can accuse me of being anti-human rights, okay? I just simply said that something that has to do with the pronoun and a thing, I guess, okay? That's just my guess, okay? So because of that, the Babylon Bee got uh, banned from Twitter, and that was like supposedly the turning point for Elon Musk where he was musing and he said, I might just buy it off. So because of that, that's the reason why Elon Musk, he just aimed for Twitter so, uh, so badly and then want to buy it out. Now, for some of you who are wondering, why is it that Babylon B, when it was banned, that uh, riled up Elon Musk? Because he actually did an interview with the Babylon B. If you look at the Babylon B's channel, the title is Full Interview, Elon Musk Sits Down with the Babylon B. And if you actually... Uh, look at that video. It shows the entire interview. The Babylon Bee, they tried to do some kind of soul winning method where they could try to witness and then be able to lead Elon Musk to salvation. Now, some Christians, they went out of hand to say he must be a saved Christian. But to be very honest, if you looked at that, no, it's sketchy. It's to be honest, it's very sketchy at best. Even a Calvinist would uh, doubt that person's salvation. All right. Paul Washer would say you are lost. All right. <laughs> Paul Washer would go that far to say that, all right? So for, uh, if they are, Calvinists themselves are not really good at it. So uh, when they just asked him, will you accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior? Elon Musk talked about Einstein being, you know, my God is a God of Spinoza. If God is in the saving deal, I, uh, nothing would hinder me from him saving. Uh, nothing would prevent me from stopping that. And they're like, well, that's a confession right there. He received Christ for his salvation. Yeah, he must. and then everyone was doing that. Now, whether that was just a little lighthearted comedy or maybe they were taking it seriously, uh, there are people out there who think that he must be a saved Christian. No, that's not how you do soul winning. The Bible talks, all right? How you, if I did that with every Joe on the street, we would have like the whole world converted, okay? Even Obama said, Obama even said, Jesus Christ is my Lord and personal Savior. Am I going to say that he's a saved Christian? <laughs> so you can't do that. That's a very sketchy testimony. He might be saved, all right? He might be, but I can only give him that much, all right? The best safe answer is it's a sketchy testimony, and I wouldn't dare say that he is a saved Christian so easily like that. Now, the liberal world, obviously, they freaked out when he uh, bought out Twitter. 
So what do I think about that? Well, Elon Musk, I believe that he will truly fulfill scripture about, I think, what, he, what his actions will do. The very next phase can be the tribulation happening. Now, before I continue on, let me explain some interesting notes about Twitter. Why is it important that he buys Twitter? And then we see a connection over here. And in this connection, you're like, well, how does it lead to this? You know, why would it lead to the Antichrist take over one day? So here are some interesting gems that you want to look at. First of all, Twitter, for some of you who didn't know, there's a history behind it, why it was named that way. The reason why Twitter was named as such is so intriguing right here. The reason why Twitter was named as such, ah, I shut it down real quick. Let me open it real quickly again. Before I explain about Twitter's name then, let me explain the other part. If your hands at Matthew 13, go to Daniel 12. If your hands at Matthew 13, keep it there and go to Daniel 12. I'll come to Twitter's meaning later because I messed up, sorry. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Now, I believe that Daniel chapter 12 is showing you, listen up now, this might be uh, something that you want to hear. I believe that Daniel chapter 12, when the Lord was quoting this verse, he was seeing Elon Musk as well. He was seeing Elon Musk as well. Now, I'm not saying that, it's, that the Lord, when he says this, he's only seeing Elon Musk. But I believe he sees Elon Musk included in this as a huge pivotal factor. Look at Daniel chapter 12. The reason why is this for some of you who don't know, okay? What is Musk known for? He is known for that traveling. The Tesla and... Uh, this is why I don't like Bible believers who already connect dots. Now the next part won't be like, wow, moment, you know. <laughs> he is known for fast transportation. He is also now, what he is now known for is knowledge and information. Why? Because of Twitter. Twitter, even Bill Gates mentioned this, is that the social media platforms is where people ha now have gained more information and knowledge than ever before at the click of a button. Elon Musk now has these two powers, travel and knowledge. The Bible says in order for the end to happen, you need these two to happen. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, uh, verse 4. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and sealed the book even to the what? Time of the end. So God's saying, keep it closed until the time of the end. Colon. These are the two pivotal factors if we want that end to be unsealed and opened up again. M many shall what? Run to and fro. Many shall run <laughs> to and fro. That's travel, technology of travel. And what? Knowledge shall be increased. There's social media. There's Twitter. Good teaching. How about that? Wow. So in order for the tribulation to take place, we need these two to come into place. Now, these two are under the power of one person now. Think about it. If uh, we do get some chaotic sprees that happen, then government has to take it over to get control. And then because one man in power was in control of that before, you need that man of sin combined with that NWO government. And then you can have in charge of these two things. See, he is literally that next stepping stone. Wow. Musk, you have to understand, is that chess piece in God's divine plan. He is absolutely salient for that. Who would have thought that these two things now can be under the power of one hand? Now you just need socialist government to take it over because it's just so out of hand so we can take care of it better and they could turn it over to one ruler and king one day if they have one, which is the man of sin. We're really close. All right, your hands at Matthew 13, right? If your hands at Matthew 13, there's something interesting about Twitter's name that Jack Dorsey stated for some of you who didn't know. The reason why they named it as such is originally they didn't use Twitter like this. They named Twitter as this. 
The reason why is because uh, there was another company who had that name. Then later on, when they bought the name, kind of like McDonald's, when they bought the name, then they turned it to Twitter. But why did they have that name Twitter like that without the E? Dorsey explained this, the origin of it. We came across the word Twitter and it was just perfect. The definition was, this is interesting, a short burst of inconsequential information. And chirps from birds. And that's exactly what the product was. That's what he said. And this can be found at uh, Los Angeles Times, title of the article, Twitter creator Jack Dorsey illuminates the site's founding document. February 18th, 2009, from David Sano. Now, understanding that uh, this is yeah. the origins and the meaning of it is referring to just a, a bunch of in, a chirping or just words or information going out that uh, we don't think about the consequences. Yeah. Come on. All right. Now, well, what are devils like and do? <laughs> yeah. These are just chirps from word, basically words that uh, don't care about consequences. In the spirit world, what birds just throw out a bunch of noise and words, and they don't care about the consequences that follow. They could care less about the consequence of sin, the, bad, the backlash that can happen. Devils. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. You didn't know that, did you? The devil's job, this is very enlightening. The reason why this is enlightening is this. Word is so powerful to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you have the word of God in your hand. Amen. If Satan wants to come back against the word of God, what's he going to use? Word. He's going to use his own words. What's the best words to fight against the word of God? Social media. Yeah. Media itself. Why? Because it spreads the information so fast that you can drown out the Word of God. Matthew chapter 13. I believe the devil's going to use this one day. I strongly believe that. And a lot of social media networks. You might say, why? Because that's how you brainwash the entire world. But because there are Christians or people who are uh, trying to throw out truth that they're joining the platform, it's spreading out more. But if you control them where they don't share the Word... And the liberal side or the antichrist side spread their word, what's going to happen? See, that's why I believe that's really going to be used by the devil. Look at Matthew 13. Look what Satan does with the word. He takes it for himself. All right. Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, that's Satan, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, this is he which receives seed by the wayside. You know what? Uh, that's representing what? Those birds who ate up the seed uh, in the mystery of the kingdom. If you look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse uh, 4, verse 4, And when he sowed some seeds, that's supposed to picture the word of God, the word fell by the wayside, and the fowls, chirp, chirp, Twitter, came and devoured them up. You know what Satan's job is? To take away the word of God, but he intakes the word for himself. Why? Because he wants to spread his own word. Isn't it his job to pervert the words of God? That's why you get 200 plus different modern Bible versions. That's what he does. All right. So it is interesting about the origin and the meaning of Twitter. I believe it's something the devil can use. There's something behind this. Now, Elon Musk, for some of you who don't know, his name has a Jewish meaning. So some people suspect him to be a Jew, but uh, obviously when they trace his ancestry and everything, he is not a Jew. Or he could be, I don't know, there might be some conspiracy behind that one. But from what I see, I don't think so. If there is something, then then he is, okay? But the point is, is that his name has a Jewish meaning. For some of you who didn't know, Elon is actually a, a name in Hebrew, for some of you who didn't know, and it is mentioned in your Bible. Elon means oak tree. Oh, wow. Oh. Come on. 
Now, if you study the history of the oak tree, there's a lot of weird, shady stuff going on, okay? Celtic Druids, for example, and a lot of in other interesting stuff. But I'm more interested to see what the Word of God says. Now, there are two interesting things about Elon Musk. First is the oak tree, his meaning. You know what? Whenever I look at the oak tree in your Bible, every single verse, you know what it points out? Or nearly, nearly every single verse, you know what God considers the oak tree to be? Look at this. Building something mighty. It's to build something great and mighty only to doom the entire people and to be destructive at the end. Interesting. That's how God thinks of the oak tree. I wonder that Elon Musk, that that is truly the case with him, where one day what he builds up is supposed to build something mighty and great for humanity, only at the end it will be their doom, and it will be humanity's own destruction. That's why, hence we know at the tribulation, mankind builds something great and mighty, but it destroys them at the end. And then humanity gets uh, destroyed, wiped out, killed, because of the antichrist technology, civilization, and kingdom that he built. These verses, just look it up every time the Bible mentions oak tree. It's intensely intriguing. The other thing about his name, Elon, there are some interesting notions. We don't have time to look at these verses, but I'm going to mention the verses. One is Genesis chapter 26, verse 34, and chapter 36, verse 2. In this passage, Elon is referring, basically, uh, the name of a Hittite where a saved uh, saint, uh, no, excuse me, not a saved saint, but basically um, where uh, the lineage of the saved saint is now uniting with something that's pagan and secular, that's a grievous, that's a grief. So that's what you're going to find, find out. Elon the Hittite, Esau married uh, one of his daughters. Mm, it's interesting where there's something right here that matches with Elon Musk, where there's a unity of some Christians or some people who proclaim to be Christians who think that this unity is an okay thing with Elon. Now, that's pretty interesting how it can match up with the spiritual meaning with Genesis 26 and 36. Now, in these passages with Elon's name, I'm not saying that God is uh, pointing out in these verses that everything matches with Elon Musk. No, that's not what I'm doing. But what I'm pointing is something that are interesting matches. That's it. Interesting pictures and matches of what happens in the Bible. It can picture and it matches with what Elon Musk is doing himself. Now, that's one. A second one is Numbers 26, 26. Uh, where it talks about Elon is from uh, the family of uh, Zebulun, is from the family of Zebulun. So he's part, so he coincides, and then he helps out God's people. He helps out God's people. Well, uh, right now we can see some things where Elon Musk, what he's doing, it seems to side or help out the Christians today. But it is interesting, Elon Musk originally from Africa, his name Elon means uh, uh, God loves you, or he whom God favors. So some of you who didn't know that. Joshua 19, verse 43, Elon is also known as a pagan place a, that is possessed. It's a pagan place that is used for possession, to take over. In Joshua chapter uh, 19, verse 43. It's interesting how that matches with Elon Musk. He is a man who possesses and takes things over for himself. Another one is uh, Judges 12, 12, where it talks about the same thing. Elon the Zebulonite. So from the tribe of Zebulun. I already mentioned that. 1 King chapter 4, verse 9. It talks about the son of Dekar in Mekaz and in Shalbim and Beth Shemesh and Elon Beth Hanan. Again, again, a place of possession, which I mentioned before. So these are some interesting matches whenever you look up the, up the word Elon in your Bible. So we've seen the references to Oak Tree and to Elon. Now, what are we 
supposed to feel or react with freedom of speech because the liberals point out that there is a free speech absolutism, that's what they called it. Uh, let me know if I'm cut off out of bounds, okay? So they'll call it free speech absolutism. And is this really a concern for Christians? Well, it's not as dramatic as some of these liberals react. Our Christian reaction is not like some of these liberals. It's so hilarious if you saw their reaction. I encourage you to actually hear them out, okay? It's a good laugh, okay? From the New York Post, title of the article, The View, some of you know The View, right? That's a liberal news source. The View's Sonny Hostin says Elon Musk bought Twitter for straight white men. So she's freaking out that Twitter is a platform for straight white men. So free speech, what that means is for straight white men. So there's going to be so much discrimination on, against the minorities and etc. Uh, here's another one. This is funny. From Politico. Title of their article. Twitter's top lawyer reassures staff cries during meeting about must take over. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? These guys were having mental breakdowns and crying, you know. They think it was the end of the world, man. Oh, so hilarious, these people. Oh, man. They're like freaking out. They think it's the end of the world. You, when Trump became president, you thought that was one story, you know. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is hilarious. The, this is from the Black Information Network, okay? So this is, they should know what they're talking about, about the NAACP. It got they were dramatizing. NAACP, they were freaking out that the title of their article, NAACP urges Elon Musk to keep Trump banned from Twitter. <laughs> they were so much out of hand that they were freaking out. Trump is going to take it over. Oh, this is the end of the world. And they were so over-dramatizing stuff. In fact, uh, this other person, it's so hilarious, Anna Navarro Cardenas, so uh, one of those uh, liberal uh, liberal speakers, she was, she tweeted, any other people out there losing followers today? Wow, people quitting this platform for real, you know, she tweeted on her Twitter. Uh, that's so hilarious. The LGBTQ+, plus, they were uh, planning to live, uh, leave, tweet, uh, leave Twitter themselves, and then some of the conservatives, they were laughing, they were saying, well, bon voyage, you know, <laughs> go away, you know, <laughs> so they didn't really care. But uh, these liberals, they're over-dramatizing. You know them. They just yeah. dramatize stuff, and they don't really do it. Title of the article from Political, Politico says, Don't expect a liberal exodus from Elon Musk Twitter. Yeah, that's true. Even the woman that got doxxed because of her TikTok where she was trying to harass people, she got doxxed and harassed herself, so then she was putting on a sh show, you know, and she was dramatizing, oh, you know, these people doxing me, they're cyberbullying me, and stuff like that. When she was doing that herself, the, the hypocrite and the liar that she is. And then she was talking about, you know, I should just... Uh, some of the liberals who were sympathizing, empathizing with her, they're all crying out, we should leave Twitter, we should go away. And these are the same people who got a boost up in their subscribers on their Twitter accounts. But they ain't leaving, they ain't leaving, they ain't leaving. They're just dramatizing. It's all a show. It's so yeah. idiotic, these people. So then, is it basically, according to the Wall Street Journal, the title of their article that I read to you, is it truly uh, Elon Musk part of this uh, few elite, the shadow crew of billionaires encouraging Twitter buyout? Well, the title from The Wrap, Elon Musk mocks Wall Street Journal story about shadow crew of billionaires encouraging Twitter buyout. Because it mentions right here, the, that the Wall Street Journal didn't give a very long list. Okay, so who are these people? Oh, this is the end of the world. Everyone's going to be taken over. The long list is only former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, Seth Dillon, who is the CEO of the Babylon Bee, and Elon Musk, three people. Wow, it's the end of the world. We're all going to die, you know. These idiots, they themselves, you should see their globalists. You should see their list, these yeah, people. Wicked. The dramatizing about what these three people, and then they themselves have a huge long list themselves. Yeah. Wicked, demon possessed people. So, is free speech a problem to this? Actually, it's not because I'm reading from the Atlantic, okay, which is a prestigious journal itself. 
the title of their article, and they side with a lot with the liberals, but they took a George, uh, they took a law professor from George Washington University itself. And the title of their article by Jeffrey Rosen, Elon Musk is right that Twitter should follow the First Amendment. And they gave these arguments that this does not violate First Amendment, okay? That the First Amendment has its right and it shouldn't be contained or restricted or put with uh, policies, content moderation or whatever they want to call it. So you can even look at that secular source and how they argued. But let's look at the scriptures. What do Christians think about that? It looks, look at Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Acts chapter 2 and verse 29. We Christians believe when these liberals start to give these arguments to you, you Bible believers should have a, a rational argument and a biblical argument. You should be able to defend your faith. You can't just look at all these sources and get something that, uh, some story that shows they're evil and then complain about it. You got to argue. You got to rationally, reasonably argue for the faith. So then we're going to look at some passages here. So let's look, let's look at all the arguments that the liberals can think of and see how we can argue against it biblically and reasonably. Acts chapter 2 and verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Yes, we believe in freedom of speech. Look at, uh, and that when I speak to you, I shouldn't be contained. Look at Acts chapter 25, uh, Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, and we'll look at verse 26. Acts chapter 26, verse 26. These are your proof texts for freedom of speech that you should write down and you can argue for your faith. Notice that Christians believe in freedom of speech. We Christians believe in that. Acts chapter 26 and verse 26. Of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Oh, so he's brought before the government. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, uh, excuse me, I'm reading chapter 25, sorry. Chapter 26, verse 26 says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. So notice right here, he's brought before the government, and he's able to speak freely. There's no government control right here. No government control. God thinks negatively of that. Let's look at Jeremiah 38, verse 4. Jeremiah 38, verse 4. Here's a passage where the Bible and where the Lord thinks negatively of government restricting speech. Well, it's because we've got to think about the general welfare of the people. The welfare of the people. It's a danger and a harm to the welfare of the people. I'll show you what God thinks about that. Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 4. The Bible says, Therefore the princes uh -huh, said unto the king, here's your government, we beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city and the hands of all the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. You're hurting all of us. You're hurting all of us. When you're speaking out about this and speaking out again, you're hurting all of us, you know. Hey, Bible shows you what God thinks of that. What we speak, when we, especially from the Word of God, we believe in freedom of it and that we shouldn't be restricted. Now look at Isaiah 41. Look at Isaiah chapter 41. I'm going to give you tons of verses. Isaiah 41. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 41. We'll look at verse 1. As a matter of fact, God believes in freedom of speech so much that he allows the wicked to freely speak. Yeah, he don't believe in, yeah, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to do content moderation and baloney. Actually, God wants them to speak freely. You might say, why would God do that? Because he wants to prove them guilty at the end. He wants them to record every word that they tweeted, Facebook, or what they said on CNN and MSNBC, and, those, and they lie through their teeth. I never said that. When we catch them many times in their reports and recordings, all right? But unfortunately, these guys are cowards, so Project Veritas has to do the work for us. So then these idiots, God believes in such freedom of speech. God believes in that. Why? So he can catch them and prove them guilty. 
Pro you think Project Veritas catching them feels good? You ain't seen nothing yet at the judgment when God shows them a video recording of their facial expression, their tone, and how they said it, and their background story of why it led them to say that. God's going to put them to shame. Look at Isaiah 41, verse 1. Keep silence before me, O people. No, islands. What? He's saying let the thing shut up so that the people can open their mouth and spill their guts. And let the people renew their strength. Let them come near and let them speak. Let us come near together to what? Judgment. Okay, go to Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 10. Here's another passage. Jeremiah chapter 10. Notice that God allows the wicked to give freedom of speech. You might say, why? Because he believes that uh, his word is powerful. That's what he believes. All right, we're going to look at Jeremiah. And actually, that's the wrong chapter. I'm sorry about that. So I wrote chapter 10. It is not chapter 10. I'll have to find it quickly. Okay. So uh, while I find it, though, uh, there are liberals uh, who might argue, well, what about if it endangers people? Or they might argue that, well, you know, would you let your children or people that you love, I mean, don't you shield them from certain words that they say? Or like the church, like if there is wrong doctrine that comes in and people gives out that word, obviously you don't allow free speech absolutism, that's what they call it, there's a restriction or there's a refraining of that. Well, the simple argument against that is this. It's because there's a difference with private and public. Even your stupid government believes that the household is private, the church is private, and that's distinguished from the public. Okay? So then, obviously, if we have our church called uh, Bible Baptist Church, what did you expect what kind of speech will come out from this church? We're not going to let people cuss do cuss words over here. Uh, if I'm in charge of my own household, I have the right to not let something, okay, come in and then tell my child what's the right way to live according to his or her orientation or whatever you want to call it. I have that right. Why? It's a private household. That's very different from public, okay? So these idiots don't know what they're talking about. There's a difference with public and private. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 3, and then the other passage in Jeremiah. Let me type it real quickly right here. Let me find it quickly. It's going to be Jeremiah chapter uh, 23. 23. We're going to look at Jeremiah 23 and Romans 3. Jeremiah 23, and then we're going to look at Romans 3. The last thing I... Uh, Another thing that they're going to argue is, well, if, what if it becomes harmful? It harms society. Obviously, at that point, you should put a restriction. If someone's talking about killing somebody, obviously, you can't let just go content-free, and then there has to be some sort of restriction if it endangers somebody. You know what's hilarious about, uh, you know what's hilarious about that? Those same people who talk like that, actually, if, it's, if we believe in public freedom of speech, and it's in the public, not private, but public domain, the government and the police can catch it more easily. They can track criminals more easily. If we're talking about violent people, people who's going to, uh, because of their speech, it might cause harm to people. Wouldn't we want to track them down and then be able to stop them before it's too late? Yeah, that's what even the Bible says. The Bible says, let them, when they give their free freedom of speech, where it even talks about violent topics, the Lord says he does that, why? So that he can cut them down quickly. So that he can prove them guilty. The law can catch them guilty. But see, if you like privatize everything, how are you going to do that then? That's good, <laughs> see these idiots talking about, well, we got to protect the public. You want to protect the public? Let them track them down. I thought you guys believed in tracking down anyways. <laughs> see, double standard, these idiots. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm going to look at Jeremiah chapter 23. And then I want you to look at verse, let's see right here. We're going to look at verse 25. 25. I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name. 
fake news, uh, disinform misinformation spreading, lies and lies. Well, what did God say about that? Saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. So what did God say about that? He is grieved. He hates that. So he says, let's restrict their speech, all right? Let's shut them down. And let's look at this. Verse 28, the prophet that hath the dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire? You know what God say? Let them talk. Why? Because my word will triumph, he says. See, let them give their garbage because God says it's not going to stop his word. His word's going to spread. And if people want to be deceived by that mess, by that information all over online, God says, let them have it. See, that's a lot. Man, God gives a lot of freedom of speech, don't he? He gives a lot of freedom of speech. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. All right? Well, what if it caused harm to society? You know what God says? That way he can catch them and prove them guilty. Good. Look at Romans chapter 3. What he says in verse 13. 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. See that? Look at their speech. It's all evil. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Look at that. They're disturbing the peace. They're against the public good and public peace and safety. So what does God say? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that what? Every, Every mouth, mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Yeah. Amen. Let them talk so that why? His law, his word, will catch them guilty on what they said. Yeah. As much as I would love, okay, as much as I would love uh, Don Lemon to just be kicked out, just like Cuomo and then uh, the other, I forgot the other guy, Jeff something, but just like these guys, you know, as much as I would like to see them go long gone, Maybe it's best that they keep yakking their mouth so that the final judgment, God can show their list of their blah, blah garbage and punish them guilty that they deserve. Glory to God. Yeah, glory to God on that one. Amen. Oh, now, pastor, you want these people to be saved? Sure, if, I, if they had a chance yeah. to repent or to be judged, I want them to repent. Yeah. But if they Amen. refuse to repent, I refuse to be sad when they get judged. Amen, brother. Amen. I'm going to be happy if they repent, and I'm going to be happy when they judge. Why? Because whatever God does, I'm going to be happy with it. Amen. His works are perfect. I'm going to rejoice and say amen to whatever he does. Amen. amen. Your boy, amen. These wicked, evil people. Amen. They give these kind of silly little arguments. Another argument that they might give is that because Twitter uh, is private, that they can put restrictions. They might argue it that way. But uh, they're just, uh, you notice that they contradicted already themselves. We caught that many times. One is the platform itself claims to be an SMS platform for the general public. That's what it's known for. Okay, it is known for that. It's not known for selected private groups with certain biases. Otherwise, Twitter is a hypocrite and should admit it. We are a group that's only for liberal, left-wing, Democrat, politicians, blah, and certain biases. Here's our statement of faith. Twitter is a church, man. Twitter is a church. It's not a public, you know, it's not for the public, you know, wording and free information. No, it's a church. They have their dogmatic doctrine set out. Here's our statement of faith that you should align with. They're more religious than you think, these liberals. <laughs> private my foot, man. Uh, then they just uh, shot themselves in the foot, man. They just admitted that something. Okay, number two, all right? If they say they're the private organization, why are they whining about Musk taking it over then? And if he wants to put his conservative beliefs, why are they whining about that? Didn't see them whining before. Yeah. These wicked, de these demon-possessed people, they, total double standards. They don't know what, what they're talking about. And here's another thing. This is the most obvious thing, okay? All right. If you want to argue private, then why did, you, why did the stupid government have to butt in 
into a private organization and tell them, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this, you should do that, and then make them cave in. Especially if you're not the government, but some idiotic Joe who doesn't even have a PhD, and because you have the power of the journal, you think you can say whatever you want when you're not a professional yourself in the medicine world or in politics or etc. Who do you think you are, man? See, you just want the power, that's why. You just want the power and tell them what to do. See, I wonder who's the elitist, huh? Who's the power we should be fearing? Idiots at its finest. And let me repeat that again. Idiots, okay? I don't care how repetitive that is. Now, liberals might say, so then you allow such absolutism and free speech where the world falls into chaos and society falls apart. Well, let me say this, is that obviously us Christians, we know that dire consequences happen from information. So obviously, we Bible-believing Christians, when we have our church, we do believe that there is a certain line and boundary that should not be crossed. But this is what they forget. What they don't understand with us Bible-believing Christians is we know this is what's going to happen to our world, so we don't, we're not amillennialist or post-millennialist, okay? We're premillennialists. We believe in freedom of speech. Let the world run as it goes. Why? Because it's going to, we do agree it will have consequences. Amen. It's going to fall apart. Why? When mankind has such freedom and run to the imagination of whatever is in their heart and in their mind, the world falls into a consequence. And that's why the Lord lets it happen that way, end up that way, so that he can show them, hey, so you see what mankind does. That in the end, their way of doing things, it's chaos. Doesn't matter if it's uh, left wing or right wing, everything falls apart. You need the king of kings and lord of lords to set up his government. And he's going to make everything set right. That's why we believe that. That's why we believe, yeah, this is going to contribute to the Antichrist, the tribulation. We believe it's going to happen that way. Now, here's the eye-opening part. I usually give my big whammy at the end, right? So that's why I want to show off is this one. Is that why I want to show is, I think I now know why. I now know why people will want to take the mark of the beast. All right? And I don't think it's because of just simply peace. I don't think it's because they're forced to do it or it's because it's a mandatory restriction. I don't think it's just because of health or safety. Uh, I think it's something way more than that. And it's a human nature pattern that we overlooked. Go to the beginning of beginnings. Go to Genesis 3. Do we believe what Satan wanted to do at Genesis, he wants to do so at Revelation? We believe that, right? Yeah, come on. Yeah, okay. So this is what Satan's kingdom always ran into. Go to Genesis 3. You teach it. Come on, Pastor. What was the temptation? Look at Genesis chapter 3. Mankind wants something. The Bible says uh, in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as what? God. God's knowing good and evil. You know what Satan knew what mankind always wanted? Knowledge. Think about every historical time period and mythology that you read about. What Egyptians, what the Aztecs and all these people, even movies when they show off about people encountering aliens, there's one thing pe mankind always wanted. Knowledge. Yeah. Go to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. I believe that there was a Twitter, Facebook at Genesis. Now, I don't mean like the same way where there was a Bluebird, and they had uh, SMS technology. No, but I believe they did have something with alien technology or something with the sons of God that spread this much so richly. Why do you think at the Noahic time period they built civilizations and stuff that today's historians are baffled how they built them? Yeah. The pyramids, you know, the Stonehenge, etc. Knowledge. Look at Genesis. That was their sin. Look at Genesis 6. That was the sin. Genesis 6. Verse 5. 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that what? Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the Lord that he had made man. That's what got the Lord riled up. It's that what's in their heart, all that thing in their heart, that knowledge, that information spreading. Where does knowledge, information come from? All that you have imagined to do in the heart. Genesis 11. Genesis 11. This is just my personal opinion, but I believe it very strongly. It makes so much sense when you look at other passages. When they built the Tower of Babel, I know why. You know what they wanted? They wanted knowledge from the gods. They wanted that again. Why? Because Genesis 11, that was a time they were losing knowledge. The longevity age was dropping. That's why civilization and stuff like that, they couldn't build to their prime, uh, former glory days as before. They were losing it. And so that's why they said, we're losing it. We need them to come down again and teach us. Genesis, that's why they're trying to build a tower to reach to heaven. They're trying to contact the gods again. Genesis chapter 11. Notice that the Bible says right here in uh, verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Look what he says. He knows their same sin is the same sin at Genesis 6 when he sent Noah's flood. And now nothing will be restrained from them which what? Which they have imagined to do. That's the consequence and the result. Yeah, absolutism or whatever. Why? The heart runs so freely and wild that at the end result, it's sin. It's sin. Isn't that interesting? Go to Daniel 12. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Yes, I believe this is the sin of mankind. That's going to contribute to why the Antichrist will build his kingdom. You might say, why is that? Because the Bible showed you that the tribulation, this has to happen. They repeat that same sin again. Knowledge. They repeat that. Look at Daniel 12, verse 4. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, if you don't believe me. What did the word of God say right here? The mankind did not fix his own sinful pattern, his habit. Look, let's be honest, guys. Every single one of you has a desire for knowledge. That's why God had to replace it with his word, right? Amen. He had to replace it with his word so that you can get away and finally just sign away and not use Facebook, Twitter, yeah. TikTok, God help us, the information that's spreading so much. He wants you to get off of that for a while and just get into his word Amen. and, yeah, and let the knowledge increase in the word. Amen. Amen. That's why God gave you that. As a little child, what do children want to do? They're always curious. Oh, yeah. Always curious. Yeah. Ever since birth, we all have a desire for knowledge, whether you believe it or not. That is our sinful nature that we have to watch out for. Look at Daniel chapter 12. Verse 4, but thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to when? The time of the end. That's tribulation. What's going to happen at the tribulation? Time of the end, many shall run to and fro and what? Knowledge, knowledge shall be increased. Notice, knowledge goes up. Knowledge goes up during the timeline of the tribulation. The tribulation. All right, here's another one. We're going to go to... Uh, Jeremiah 10, Jeremiah chapter 10. Now, this is the most eye-opening part. Okay, you ready for this? I believe very strongly that I think I know human nature, human pattern ever since Genesis to now. This is the most enlightening thing ever. If you want to know what human nature is, you want to make money off of and become a billionaire, this is it. Mankind has an infatuation with such knowledge and information from the imagination of their heart. But from the imagination of their heart, such words are not enough. They have to visually picture. Hence, they have to have an image as well. Mankind, your human pattern and nature is addicted to, to these things simultaneously. Knowledge and information combined with image. Now think about it. 
Why are people addicted to this? It's appealing to the eye. That's why YouTube gets a lot of hits. Because image is appealing to the eye. Why did Facebook make its design that way? Catchy to the eye. It's an image. That's why they have to, if they did a robot computer old style, no one would get on Twitter. But do something with your iPhone, bloop, a nice message, something like that, appealing to the eye, and combine it with a video or a picture, it's more powerful. But YouTube is spreading so much information combined with the image. Facebook, Twitter, everything combines image with information, and that spreads like wildfire. You know what the Bible says? At the time of visitation, which is a tribulation, mankind, they have a problem with knowledge and image combined. Knowledge and image combined. Look at Jeremiah chapter 10. We'll look at verse 14. Verse 14. Every man is brutish in his what? Oh. Knowledge. Every, and, but what God sees this aligned with is what? Oh. Every founder is confounded by the what? Graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. When? When? The Bible says, verse 15, They are vanity and the work of errors in the time of their what? Visitation, they shall perish. Why would God say up till the time of the tribulation? That's when God's going to destroy the image and the knowledge. Unless it has to happen. Think about it. Facebook is all about information, but you combine image, metaverse. How many people will go for that? Let me show you one of the, uh, an interesting thing. All right, we're not going to look at all these verses, but I double dare you to look up every passage in, uh, in the book of Revelation. All right? Look at every passage in the book of Revelation about the mark of the beast. You know what's very interesting? All the time, all the time, the Bible mentions the mark of the beast. It always mentions... Image. Every verse in Revelation, look it up. Every verse in Revelation. And then you'll see the context. Revelation 13 won't say image in that same verse, but if you look at the context, like uh, it mentions image already at Revelation 13, and then the mark. Wow. That's why I believe mankind, they will sign up for the mark of the beast easily. Why? There's something in our nature. We want knowledge, and we love images. Because we love knowledge and images, that's why I strongly believe they will willingly take the mark of the beast. Why? Mankind wants knowledge. They want to know a lot. And they love imagery. They want to interact. They want to see. You know what the scary thing is? The scary thing is this, is that if that's what the mark of the beast is, it's some kind of mark, right? But you, see, you hear so many reports already where mark of the beast is tied to microchip and that the chip, it can connect or link itself to internet. So you hear so many reports about that. If, if the mark of the beast has to do with the chip, and people are already buying or selling with that, all right? There are some prototypes already given out on that. And some prototypes connecting that with the internet and computers, technology. So if that's the case, what if it's something where I'm going to receive this and put it in my head? Why? That way I can see the images yeah, and so I can increase knowledge so I can be like gods. Yeah, come on. Take it, bro. And this is very, very, very possible mm -hmm. because people are saying Elon Musk Neuralink uh -huh is pro possibly the prototypes or the steps to the mark of the beast. Wow. Now, this is a scary part. You ready for this? Yeah. Some people said this. Elon Musk is now in charge of information, yeah. which combines images, but also there's one thing, Neuralink. And you know what some people are afraid of? They actually said, imagine the wonders. Elon Musk ain't stupid, guys. And he wants to change our world with advanced technology. You don't have to be an Einstein to think about the wonders of combining this and this together. Imagine information as soon as you can think of it at your demand. 
And do you think mankind's going to turn that down? Not even an atheist would turn it down. No PhD scientist would turn it down. They love it. Information, knowledge. Me shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Combining, combine it with image. Oof. Addicting. Addicting. Here, here's some articles. If you don't believe me, there are several articles about this. From Forbes magazine, title, Under Musk, Twitter, Neuralink is a natural pairing. Another one from Tweak Town, and they're, a tech, they're a supposedly an unbiased technological, technology source and news. Title of the article, Elon Musk will probably use Twitter data to feed his Neuralink AI tech. How soon? Well, according to the Washington Post, title of the article, Why Neuralink, Not Twitter, is Elon Musk's Biggest Challenge. How soon? This year, maybe. Whoa. That was his original goal. But, it, uh, but there was postponing of that. Shh. Nuts. Imagine that. Imagine that. Obviously, this did not happen yet. And scientists are saying, you know, it's, it's hard to think that it's possible, but with Musk, that's why some scientists will use a joke, and Musk is the butt of their jokes, because they talk about, like, this is unheard of among scientists, but then you saw the wonders of Musk and certain people, how they were able to get mm, out shorter than they thought, and then the things that Musk accomplished that they thought he wouldn't accomplish, he did. You got to realize, see, that's why we're very close. We're very close. That's why I believe also we need a little bit more time too. Why? If one, you need to sink this. You need to sink this. We're not there yet, but people are talking about possibilities of how this can really work out and it will become a powerful combo to the realm of science. Man, that's something, is it not? Yeah. That's really something right there. Wow. Let me close it with this. Elon Musk has, has a lucky thing that he relies on. He has a lucky thing, and it seemed to work whenever he took over and bought, bought certain properties, technology. When he bought this, and let's say this one, and this one, and other stuff will contribute to the Mark of the Beast one day, all right? The Mark of the Beast, for it is the number of the man, and his number is uh, 666, 666. Elon Musk's secret code that he used to buy Twitter was... Four, two, and zero. What does that equal? Six. Six. Title of the article from Independent. Elon Musk, Tesla chief, uses secret code in stunning bid for Twitter. Four, two, all. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, tonight's teachings have something uh, been revelatory, eye-opening, and also how close we are to your coming. But more importantly, how Christians should uh, be prepped up for what's coming to, be more uh, to believe more that your book is true and to also uh, bolden us that time is so short so we need to be aware of what Satan's going to do so that we can come back, but also at the same time be able to survive as a church and win souls to Christ. Amen. So looking at these things, it helps me plan out, Lord, what we should do as a church. Yeah. So thank you, Lord, for uh, showing us some of these things and that uh, we'll be uh, on guard and we'll be able to try to get to work in your field to spread out the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.